So I'm going to work really hard to stick to just under half an hour with this one, um, because this is the flip side of the coin. This is the um, the previous presentation we were talking about inquiry within a subject. This is the extracurricular inquiry where we're taking inquiry outside of subjects. And this is extracurricular in the sense that it's not within a subject teacher's classroom. But these, we're, I'm looking at the IB extended essay and the extended project qualification. These are very much assessed um, school leaving qualifications. So they are still qualifications. They're just not within a particular subject teacher's classroom. So I'm not going to spend much time on the individual qualifications because the point is more about the lessons that I've learned from them. But particularly some of you will be more familiar with these than others. A quick comparison of, of what the two things are. They are both um, extended inquiry projects for students of 17 to 19 years age um, as school leaving qualifications. So the extended essay is um, a part of the compulsory core of the IB diploma. All students doing the IB diploma have to pass the extended essay or they will not get their diploma. And the extended project qualification is an optional, essentially A-level subject. So you can choose to take it or not. Some schools choose to ask all of their students to do it. A lot of schools, it's, it's an option. Um, extended essay is a 4,000 word research essay. The extended project qualification is really interesting because it can either be a 5,000 word research essay or it can be a research based artifact and an artifact can be absolutely anything. So um, it can be something very traditional like a work of art or a piece of music. Um, it can be something completely different like organising a charity event or rebuilding a motorcycle. Um, anything that the student can imagine. One of our students this year wrote a neurodiversity handbook for the teaching staff and that was her artifact the only stipulation is it must be research based it can't so if you choose to do a piece of art that's brilliant but you can't just do it straight that's the artifact that we had um, you can't just do it straight out of your head um, you have to go away and do research if you're doing an artifact there are two strands to that research there's the subject of what you're doing your artifact on so for my student here, it's neurodiversity. But then the other strand of that is the particular artifact you're making. So you might do some research into what makes a good handbook, what fonts should you use, um, how do teachers respond to the handbook that you make, or with art, the techniques that you're going to use. The extended project qualification as well, you have to do a presentation. The presentation itself is assessed. The presentation is not about your product alone. It's about the whole process of making that product and the research process. Um, extended essay has very strict subject specific guidelines. So most extended essays sit within a particular subject and there are guidelines about that, like um, politics is something like it must be something that's happened in the last five years. Um, economics largely but not, it, not exclusively requires you to do um, primary research if you can. Um, so there are very, very strict guidelines that you must follow if you're doing it within a subject. And then there is a, a world studies essay that you can do where you combine more than one subject. But again, there's very strict guidelines. Extended project qualification, pretty much anything goes. The only restrictions that you have is that you can't um, do something that's too close to one of your A-level subjects. You can't get credit on an A-level exam for writing about stuff that's in your extended project qualification. It's got to be an extension. Um, and um, I'm sure there's something else. Oh, and it's got to be of A-level standard. It's got to be of, of suitable standard for a higher order qualification, but that's it. You can do anything you like, really. Um, extended essay is worth three points out of a possible, out of a total of 45 for the whole diploma. Um, it's a bit complicated because the three core components make up those three points and there's a grid for how well you do in each one. So it's a kind of maximum of three points. It's quite underweighted compared with how important it actually is to the philosophy of the diploma in terms of the, the credit that you get for it. Extending project qualification is worth half the traditional A level. It's what we like, what we might call an AS level here, um, technically. Universities don't necessarily 
um, treat it in the same way as an A-level subject. So some universities will weight your offer in A-level subjects based on what you did in your extended essay, but it's not quite the same as an A-level subject. The um, teaching and supervision is very different. Um, for the extended essay, you are allowed a maximum of three to five hours of personal contact time with your supervisor, and you shouldn't go beyond that. And that includes three formal reflection sessions. And beyond that, the school can provide whatever group support it feels is appropriate, but there's no stipulation of what that support is. IB schools are expected to have a library with a librarian who is involved in education. So there is an expectation of the involvement of the librarian in that, but there's nothing kind of written down of what they need to do. Extended project qualification, there is an expectation that there is a 30 hour taught course that the students attend. Um, and on top of that, they also have individual supervision. There is no restriction for how much supervision they can have, but you have to be careful not to be seen to be over directing the students and telling them what to do. In the extended essay, the supervisors are expected to um, be experts in the subject that the student chooses. Extended project qualification, interestingly, they actually advise, they don't enforce, but they advise that the supervisor is not an expert in the subject that you're taking. So the, the chief moderator was talking about um, maybe having an English teacher supervising a maths essay because it makes it very it makes it much more difficult for the supervisor to over direct and tell the student what to do that if the supervisor isn't an expert also makes it slightly more challenging when you're coming to market to make sure that the student has actually got the the work right you might need to show it to a colleague who um, who is an expert in that subject to help you with that extended essay has no clear guide on how much independent time the students take on it whereas extended pro project qualification there is an expectation that the student will spend 120 hours on it over the course, um, 30 hours of which are the taught course. So you can see there's, there's quite a weighting towards what they're doing on their own. Um, the extended essay assesses the inquiry process through three reflections that the students have to write, and it's quite a high weighting. It's almost 20% of the mark. I think it was 17-ish percent of the mark was on the reflections, but they're only allowed 500 words for those. And for a student to write mature reflections on their research process in a total of 500 words, that's for all three, not for each one, is really hard. Um, and that's quite a skill. The extended project qualification, you get something called a production log, a document that they have to work through all the way through the process, recording what they're thinking, what they're doing, what progress they're making as they go through. And it's um, that is an integral part of the assessment process. And the assessment is actually more on the process that they go through rather than necessarily just the, the artifact that they produce. And in their presentation, they need to be reflecting on the process. Extended essays, externally marked. The EPQ, the supervisor marks it. It's then moderated within the school and then it's moderated outside the school which actually means the supervisor has to have a very strong understanding of the marking criteria, which helps them with the supervision, I think. Um, it makes, makes that supervision a little bit easier because you have to know what they're being marked on. Um, in terms of my background here, my background is much more strongly in the extended essay. Um, I spent two years directly as part of my job title supporting the extended essay at Oakham School, but actually, I was building on 13 years worth of experience in the team. I'd been involved in that, incidentally, a lot through those years. And I, I married Daryl. I live at home with him. He was in charge of that library. We talked about the extended essay a lot through those 13 years. So I've got a lot of experience with the extended essay. The EPQ is very new to me. I was just working on um, building support for that at Oakham because we didn't research. Daryl and that was his a big part of his job so I was working on supporting him with that just before we left and then when we arrived here um, in October this year I took over as EPQ coordinator so I've only really been doing the EPQ um, in a in a very um, embedded way since October this year um, but I've pulled together 10 lessons that I've learned through that I'm going to try and work my way through those 10 lessons in 15 minutes um, which will be a challenge um, and my first one is to meet your inquiries where they are, because inquiries get stuck 
at different stages of that inquiry process and you have to know where they're stuck in order to be able to move them on they all need different things i picked up five students who've been working on their epqs since the previous january i picked them up as the coordinator and as all of their supervisors in october and i needed to get them finished by february this year um, and they were all stuck in different places so the, the first student had a super idea about political photography. He was really interested um, in the role of images and pictures in politics and how, how they shaped political conversations. Um, but he had a mass of images. He'd spent ages collecting a wide range of different images and he had way, way too much. And he was really stuck in Connect because he couldn't get from all of this background information into a topic that actually was going to work for him in 5,000 words and 120 hours. So the big thing for him was to sit with him when we sat with all of his photographs and worked out what one thing he was really interested in. And he chose to focus on um, the role of imagery in the AIDS crisis. And his final presentation was about um, how imagery in the United States and in South Africa relating to the age crisis was different and how that was shaped by the cultures in those two different countries and it was absolutely fascinating what he produced but what he had in the beginning he couldn't get there because he was stuck um, my second student was um, doing something on dementia and had really quite a, a complicated topic about Lewy body dementia and he was stuck because he couldn't understand his topic the resources he was accessing were way too high level and his biology teacher helped him find some resources that helped him to access the topic and I helped him to get in touch with um, Guernsey Institute Library which is a, a local library that um, has a lot of really useful resources on um, health and medicine um, and through that he could access the topic and then he could access the, the more difficult resources that he'd been using before. Um, I had one student who was skipping construct and was had done all her investigate and was starting to write but she didn't really understand her argument she didn't know what she was writing about so we, we pulled her back and stopped her writing and started her planning and actually when she when she went back into construct she realized that there were some key bits of her investigation that she'd missed and she hadn't done so she went back to investigate and once she'd filled in those gaps then she felt ready to write she was okay to go on to express and I had one of those students who was stuck in Express. She'd done a brilliant job. She'd, it was actually this, this student who had produced the, the handbook. She'd produced an amazing handbook, but she was stuck in a cycle of um, refining it and sending out, getting feedback, refining it based on this feedback, sending it out again, getting more feedback. And she needed help to just stop, back off, say, right, it's now good enough. I now need to think about writing my research report because I can't stay in Express forever. Um, and then this year, in my cohort this year, I had one student who um, was really interested in ethics, but she couldn't manage to find a question that she wanted to answer. She couldn't find, um, she, she was struggling to ask questions about the topic. And with her, we took a book, um, a much more general book about ethics, and I asked her to just take each chapter in the book and to make a mind map of, of that chapter and then to branch out on that mind map with questions that she had. And that really helped her to narrow down and decide what she was actually interested in. Um, my second lesson is about taking the point of view of the inquirer and thinking about what it's like to be that inquirer. And this was very much what we took from the extended essay, that is the timetable that you're writing driven by the processes that the students need to go through or is it driven through by the administration that you need to go through so we had when we started at Oakham in 2008 we had a very process um, administratively driven process we need to assign supervisors by this point we need to get the students to submit their essays by this point so these are the things we need as an organization to make that happen it didn't help the students because it wasn't what they needed to do and how they needed to be worked work to make that happen at those points and as you're thinking about that process driven you're also thinking outside your own inquiry um, to what else your students are dealing with so when do they have mock exams when do they have coursework in other subjects when are their pinch points and how do I organize my big extended inquiry to allow for those pinch points for them and to let them deal with all the stuff that they need to deal with 
So when we started Oakham, um, we had this. So we had um, a seminar in December when they were introduced to the extended essay. Within a week, they had to decide what their topic was going to be because we needed to get them a supervisor. So they had one week really to decide what they were going to write about. Um, and then they had five months on their own to kind of sort themselves out before we had a whole week off timetable for them to write. But they weren't ready to write at that point because they, during those five months, had other subjects and other things to do. And the extended essay was at the back of their mind because that's not happening until May. Um, and they needed a lot more support. So what Daryl did when he got started with the, the um, IB coordinator, he looked at the process. He looked at what stages of the process they were going to be in at different times. Um, over time, and this certainly happened to an extent as well when I took over that role, we drifted that first seminar back into November. We gave them much more time to think about what they said. We, we gave them the introduction and then we gave them a few weeks to really talk to the subject teachers and think about what, what topic they wanted to do before we needed to assign the supervisors. We got them to submit some paperwork. We got them to think about what they wanted to do, submit an application form. We gave them some more support in January and then we got them to submit a research proposal. So they were stepping through the process of working out what they were going to do rather than um, having to just decide within a week and then that's it, you're committed, off you go. We also introduced some, some other interventions. So we had um, an IT workshop to give them the skills that they needed. We split that extended essay week. We didn't give them any more off timetable time. We gave them three days of it in February and two days of it in May because that meant they had three days to really get to grips with their investigation, to find some resources, to start working with those resources, to start thinking about those resources. So then they've got those five months to mull over the resources that they have and to work out what their ideas are before they need to start thinking about writing. <coughs> we um, got them to meet with a supervisor, agree their research question, discuss what they're going to read. At that point, way back in February, so that they're on the right track from the beginning, and then in those writing days in, in May, um, we gave them some more, another seminar, more support, but we also gave them some more IT skills relating to the citing and referencing um, and had a lot of, of library support available there. The other thing that is really important is with any inquiry, have you had a go at it? And I think as librarians, we're all very aware of this, teachers set research projects where they haven't looked for resources they don't know how difficult it is to find them and if i as a, an experienced librarian can't find resources on this topic what hope has a 17 year old got so always having a go seeing what we can do to help and what it's like to be them and a lesson i learned as a physics teacher um, way back before all of this was um we were struggling with students with practical skills for practical exams. And the technician was sitting there in the prep room. He said to me, I don't understand why you teachers are all moaning about the fact that students are all so bad at practical skills. If they're also all so bad at it, you didn't teach it to them. So you need to go out and teach them how to do it. And if all of our students are bad at citing and referencing, if they're all copying and pasting, if they're all struggling to synthesize their ideas, we didn't teach it. So we need to make sure that all those things that they're all so bad at, we're giving them instruction and we're helping them to, to work through those. Um, the third thing I found was um, engaging with inquirers as people, engaging with their feelings, helping them to engage with their feelings and to understand what it is that they're um, thinking and feeling at different stages. So um, this is some, some very famous work um, by Carol Coulthard. Um, in relation to her guided inquiry stuff that we, we synthesised a bit with the fossil stages and pulled together with our extended essay process. And telling students that at the beginning, connecting is hard, you're going to feel very uncertain. Then you'll get a question, you'll, you'll start to feel a bit better, and then you'll try to investigate your question, you'll realise it's actually quite hard, and you're going to feel this confusion, frustration and doubt. And if you don't feel that, your question is probably too easy. And particularly for the extended SNEPQ, if they don't go through this confusion, frustration and doubt, they probably don't have a topic that's going to make a good 4,000, 5,000 word essay. It's probably too simple. And then as you go through, you start to feel better, you start to get more confidence, 
um, and you're ha either happy with what you've produced or you're not happy with what you've produced. Um, but as an adult, I go through this every time. Every time I start something new, I always go through that. I can't do this stage. And I feel better knowing that that's coming. And I know that my students feel better. I show them this. I know they feel better because they know that they are expected to feel like that and it's OK and it's not going to last. Um, the fourth thing that we learned was that connecting takes time. And I've touched on that already with the extended essay. And we talked about it a bit at, at dinner last night. I know Ali was talking about um, this paradox of choice. Um, and this, this was um, 2004. And a friend who was an economics teacher who talked a lot about the paradox of choice. Learning to choose is hard. And learning to choose well is harder. And learning to choose well in a world of unlimited possibilities is harder still, perhaps too hard. And when you have a free inquiry like this, where you can choose anything, that's really paralyzing. It's really hard for a student. If I say to you, go away and investigate um, the relationship between the Queen Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots, I can do that. If I say to you, choose something and go away and investigate it and write 5,000 words on it, that's really hard. Um, so it takes time. It requires a lot of scaffolding. Um, we have a similarly to the extended essay process. I've put together a, a journey for them so they can see where it's what's happening when and in our EPQ process I give them three months and within that three months we are constantly working through and touching back on what it is that um, we need to do to help them to support them to find something that is going to work for them and they're going to be passionate about one of my students last year started a topic and worked on it for three or four months before she realized her heart wasn't really in it and she started all over again with a new topic and again, this is again the student who did the, the neurodiversity handbook because she knew she was never going to finish if she didn't choose a topic that her heart was really in. Something nice here about the EPQ is you can see this arrow on the right, this taught skills arrow. Um, and I've, I've taken some of this graphic directly from the, the AQA, the, the exam board website. Um, but we front load the taught skills. So we spend a lot of time in the beginning teaching them things that they're going to need later on because it gives them thinking time. While we're busy teaching all these skills that they need, they've got time to mull over what topic they're going to choose. The other thing that I do with the EPQ is I have an introductory session with the year 11s, with the um, students who are 15, 16, they're just before they start their A-level course, um, sort of advertise the EPQ to them. And I use that as a way in to get them to think about what things do you enjoy thinking about, talking about, what are your passions? What are your interests? What are you going to go on to do later um, after you leave school? What subjects do you like? So they've already started thinking about these things before they get to the point of wanting to choose a, sub a topic. Um, my fifth question is about good questions. Good questions evolve over time. We were asking them at the beginning of the extended essay process to tell us what their question was. They can't do that if they don't know anything about their topic. So actually, you tell them, you ask them to tell you what topic they're interested in at the beginning, but they don't actually need to finalise their research question here until way, way into the investigate stage because they can't find, well, they can't think of a good question until they really understand their topic. Um, they just need to keep um, refining that direction until they're ready to write a good question. The EPQ, I'm quite impressed with how they've written their materials and the, the chief moderator, um, Christine Andrews, clearly has quite a good understanding of, of inquiry. Um, and they actually build this into the process. So in the, the forms that they need to fill in, they give a working title right at the beginning. So in that sort of January time for us, but they don't actually need to finalise the title until they get to the mid project review. So that's in May. So the EPQ material really understand that this is, is something that evolves over time. Investigation is really messy. We're librarians, we know that. Um, it's really difficult. And students need to understand that it's OK to go backwards and forwards, that it's OK that I found something and that's led me to something else, but that takes me back to something else over here. And when they're not used to these long extended inquiries, they need support with that. So we give them things like an annotated bibliography so they can record all of their sources 
and little notes about the sources so that when they go back to them, they know um, what they used and why. Um, we give them the investigative journal to support them with making notes. And something I found really useful is I give them a keyword record because when they go come to me or they go to the subject teacher and say, but there's just nothing out there on my topic. We know that's not true, but we don't know how they've been looking. And watching a sports science lesson, um, I found that um, the subject teacher was very, very, very good at the keywords. He understood what keywords were needed for his subject and the students didn't. So if the students can, when they come to me, if they can give me a list of the keywords they've been searching with, I don't necessarily need to take their search over and do their search for them. I can say, oh, could you not expand that keyword out here? Could you not add an additional keyword here? They can go away and they can have another go at the searching and they can do that with their subject teacher as well. Um, the other thing I, I do with students, and again, I'm, I'm sure many of you do too, is they love to search for books on Amazon. Um, they've looked in my library, they can't find the books in my library, they, we need to buy something, they search on Amazon, and the search facility on Amazon is really poor in terms of um, finding something where you can refine it. So we teach them to search in WorldCat, and you, you look in WorldCat, because then if you find a book on WorldCat where you've got a really good search facility, you can then take that and search for it on something like Amazon and, or a local bookseller and see how much that's cost and whether you'd be able to get a hold of it, or whether you can get hold of it in a local library. Um, construction, the construct stage requires scaffolding. It's really important. We are all here because we are good at construct. We are good researchers. We are good at pulling our ideas together. And we may not even ever have been taught that, that, that we are the kinds of people who enjoy looking for resources, finding information, and pulling it together. It's natural for us. It's not necessarily natural for all of our students. So we need to give them some scaffolding with that. I've talked about that a lot with Joe. Um, but I take different scaffolding for different types of topic. Um, for EPQ, you have to be quite careful because they are very anxious you're not allowed to provide the um, uk authorities do not allow you to provide a writing frame for coursework you're not allowed to provide a write this write this write this job done your coursework is done and making sure that our construction sheets are about processing thinking and making sure you understand what it is that you're needing to do um, rather than an essay plan is very important um, and we use that one as well with Joe, this idea of pulling ideas together. This person thinks this, this person thinks this. And these are the things that everybody agrees on. And if you can come from everybody agrees on this, and these are the different opinions, that really helps students with this idea of perspective. Um, nearly there. Um, my eighth lesson was about synchronous and asynchronous support. So providing support lessons where you are teaching students um, in front of you all at the same time, all doing the same thing but also support where you've got students who can access resources at their own time, at their own pace. Um, so you might have workshops and lessons, and whatever, but you also might have um, online courses you're directing them to, videos, guides, things that they can use when they need them at point of need. So for the extended essay, we got quite good at this. We developed a series of um, ICT videos. So for things like the citing referencing, using different tools, one of the, the really helpful things about those was um, that we could develop videos for Mac, for PC, um, for people who were using things like um, different, some of the devices that can't access some of the tools that we were using, different sets of videos for different students that they could work through, appropriate videos for their device in their own time, and we can support them with that as they need it. One of my colleagues developed lessons on a um, something called Nearpod, which allows um, online lessons. Um, and we produced a LibGuide similar to the one that I showed you for politics. It allowed students to access it whenever they wanted to, wherever they wanted to. We had students from all over the world um, and at their own pace. So I'm going to go through this super quick because I'm eating into Kevin's time. Um, that we just, we, we structured it by the different stages of inquiry. I told them that all the time where they were supposed to be. We had a blog in there that told them where they were supposed to be, what they were supposed to be doing at each particular time, um, and a tab for each stage of the inquiry with all of the resources there on the right and information help on the left. Um, and that linked into two different guides that I produced, 
which were available for all of the students, not just the extended essay students on citing and referencing um, and on finding resources for particular subjects, recommended resources for particular subjects. Um, for the EVQ, I haven't quite got that far yet because I've only been doing that since October. Um, I'm looking at developing that. At the moment, I'm working within Teams and within the OneNote, just putting all of the information that, that we've used um, into the OneNote and getting them to use the OneNote as um, a research journal. Um, and getting them to access some of these online courses. It's huge within the EPQ that they want you to be learning skills for yourself. So accessing some of these online courses is a brilliant way for them to learn different skills. Um, Future Learn produces a couple of different courses for EPQ, which are lovely add-ons. They are not sufficient by themselves and they absolutely don't replace the role of the librarian. Um, ninth lesson is about encouraging reflection all the way through. Reflection is not just a stage at the end. Um, so I asked my students to keep a, a research diary to look at the changes, the problems, um, to get that, that evidence in different places. They can choose if they want to print a notebook, if they want to do it one note, if they want to do it um, in a Word document, um, and to set themselves regular targets that they are then deciding whether they're on track. Um, we, I also use, um, Barbara produced a wonderful set of questions for where you should be at different stages in the cycle, um, what questions you might ask yourself at the beginning of Connect and the end of Connect, start of Wonder and the end of Wonder, things like that. That's really helpful to me. Um, and finally, don't forget your team. Um, so we have um, a support triangle. Some of these people may be the same person. Um, so the coordinator, the supervisor and the library staff. Now, certainly last year within the EPQ, they were all me, um, but they are three very, very separate roles. And it's important, even if they are all you, to recognise these as an administrative role, um, a support, a one-to-one -one support role and an inquiry specialist role. And that you understand that these are three very, very separate things. And we need to support the team. So with the EPQ, I have five training sessions within the year to train my team to make sure we're all on the same page or doing the same things for the students. Um, I have a strength and support for them. So with the E, I had a page on my level guide for the supervisors. EPQ, I've got a SharePoint site for them with all of the resources that they need. And cheating and adding an extra one. I wouldn't start here if I were you. It's a, an old joke that um, you have somebody who's lost in the middle of the countryside and getting more and more frustrated and comes upon a, a local person and um, how do I get to wherever it is I want to get to and oh I wouldn't start here if I were you. Well that's tough, I'm here, I need to start here. Um, we don't want to start with these skills in the sixth form, it's too late. Trying to get students up to speed with all of these skills at 17 years old is far too late. We need to start much further down the school. Um, we know that as librarians, but we need to be persuading our schools of that. And actually we are very, very lucky here because we have a school that starts all the way from three years old. And we can start embedding those schools from children who are three years old. And we're working with this framework of skills um, that Barbara developed um, that we can use to guide us for what should a three-year-old be doing and be learning in order that when they're 18, they can write an extended essay on EPQ. And that is a, a really important backbone of what we do. So I'm really sorry, Kevin, I've gone 10 minutes over, but um, that's it, I'm done. And I'm around afterwards to talk, but I don't think it's fair to Kevin for me to take questions now. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you.